welcome everyone. This is Aprajita. I'd like to welcome everyone, uh, the panelists and also all the attendees um, for our first webinar on uh, building our power in Age of AI. And we will be doing five webinars uh, in the coming months uh, as a total around this. Uh, big thank you for to Anna uh, Roseman from Test Masters Academy for hosting these for us. Um, and I would like to welcome the panelists today. So we have Andrew Birkholz from Pink Lion. We have Jason Jarina from New York Life Insurance. And we have Davar Ardalan from IWOW. I'll be moderating um, along with Anna. Um, I like uh, all the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Jason. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, this is Jason Jarina. I'm the head of quality um, engineering for our insurance and annuities line of business at New York Life. I've been in quality assurance and engineering for north of 20 years now. Uh, I grew up as a line of uh, uh, hands-on tester, um, leading into management and then senior level roles. So I look forward to the conversation today. Thanks. Welcome, Jason. Andrew? Hey, um, I'm Andrew Burkholz. I'm one of the founders of Pink Lion AI, uh, as well as the chief technology officer. Um, so I've been, my background, I, I was a QA consultant and a development consultant for about 15 years, I, you know, in and out of like, I don't know, 40, 50 companies and um, automating really unique things like, uh, you know, stuff on smart TVs and med devices and, um, you know, all sorts of interesting automation challenges. So at Pink Lion today, I'm more responsible of creating our new tech and new product and innovating with, you know, an AI first approach. And thanks for having me. Thanks, Andrew. Adawar? Yes, thank you so much. It's exciting to be joining you today for this webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Anna Roisman, for being such a goddess. Um, we met in Dublin, Ireland at Quest for Quality um, almost two years ago, uh, where Anna was a keynote speaker and uh, several other testers uh, in the community ended up really becoming part of um, you know, some of the work that I'm doing around artificial intelligence and cultural intelligence in particular. And uh, we're gonna be launching um, some new data set challenges. Uh, these will be crowdsourced and we thought it would be amazing to collaborate with the testing community as we do these crowdsourced data set challenges to understand how do we test algorithms, you know, how do we test data sets and really make this collaborative because um, my background <clears throat> is that I was at NPR News as a journalist for over two decades, where I collaborated with uh, many different people around the world and uh, really believe that the future of AI and the power that we have in it will be even more uh, impactful if there's an interdisciplinary approach. And I think testers will be at the front lines of testing artificial intelligence, making sure that the personalization and cultural relevancy will be on point. So grateful to be here. Thank you, Devar. Welcome, all three of you. Uh, this is a project that's talking. Um, I live in California and I lead the bioinformatics software test team at Garden Child. I'm very, very excited for this webinar. And as Devar said, we have a few more coming. Uh, and this is very, it is very exciting times to be collaborating with Anna from Test Masters Academy and to be talking about these um, new uh, technologies as we grow into them. So briefly going over the agenda, we will be talking about uh, the brief history and current trends in the industry uh, and just where AI is used. Uh, Jason would be leading that. And then uh, moving forward, we will be covering the next generation of testing needs in uh, machine learning and AI land. Uh, Andrew would be covering that and then the last would be to go over to the bar to talk about uh, the data set challenges that IWOW are, is uh, launched and opportunities for uh, QA, uh, uh, you know, uh, folks and everybody um, in general. And at the end, we'll take questions. So I'll get started. Um, Jason, over to you. Oh, you're, this oh, is your side. Right. 
I can go ahead then. Okay. So uh, very quickly, uh, the source of this, I did not make this image. Uh, the source of this is from uh, Google. And this is a very brief history of AI. So it, uh, apparently it's not something very new. The concept of AI started very, very early on, somewhere in the 1950s. And um, it, it took us a while, almost, you know, talking about artificial intelligence, it took like 1974 almost when computers actually uh, started to reach a point where they could be used for some of this. 1980s is when most of the AI research grew because of funding and also uh, involvement of the community. Uh, and it was almost two decades, so somewhere in 2000, early 2000s is when AI started to thrive without funding from uh, government. It was more a uh, public domain. And here we are now today, right? Uh, almost in 2020, uh, talking about uh, the next steps in AI and even uh, involvement of uh, QA and testing in this area. Uh, I wanted to take a, I wanted to stop and think about how AI is in our lives in general. Uh, and I really just thought about everything that we do from you know, as soon as we wake up. So as soon as I wake up, generally I have the phone in my hand. So we're talking about social networking. So if you have looked at Facebook or any of these other, um, you know, social websites, they all use AI and machine learning. Agriculture, believe it or not, uses AI. Um, shopping, if you're shopping at Amazon and you get ads, that's a pretty obvious um, place to know of AI. Automobiles use AI and we're developing more autonomous um, cars now. Banking uses AI as well. So a good example is um, when you click a picture of your check, you know, to deposit it, it has to detect everything. That's an example. Education. So if you take SAT exams or even in some colleges now, they're starting to build um, AI systems or ma like machine learning systems, which um, you know, are used in the field of education. Smart devices obviously use it. Uh, and healthcare, which is my primary domain, uh, has started to use it extensively as well. So it covers a lot of our lives. Um, we just need to really think about uh, what applications are using it and not. Uh, off to Jason. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so I'm gonna focus my conversation points around the quality assurance and engineering function and uh, specifically what AI means to that, that role in technology um, and how uh, the, the role should, could, could continue to evolve through the use of AI. So if we look at the current AI tool landscape, um, these are marketplace tools that I'll reference. So tools that you could buy off the shelf. So COTS-based applications that you would buy in the marketplace. Many of them claim to do AI. Um, so they are not, Jason. however, can you hear me okay? Hi, can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, Aprogito's screen I, I, froze, but we can hear you, yes. Okay, gotcha, okay. I heard her say my name, so that led me to, sorry about that. Um, the tools are ex post facto in nature, meaning that they do a Pareto analysis of your execution data, your defect data, and they offer recommendations of what you should perhaps do in future tests. Um, they, they may also review requirements that are changed and assess the impact against test cases and may do things like um, use trace matrices or make pairwise testing recommendations um, so that you can be more effective and streamlined in what you test. Rather than test the universe, maybe they recommend that you test the moon um, in, in a given initiative. They typically need 10 plus cycles of execution and defect data to make intelligent decisions and recommendations. Okay, so the next slide would be um, a, a review of uh, a current state review of automation. So um, there is a pivot in, the f in our field towards agile, and this is not new. Uh, this has probably been over the past 10 plus years, there's been a pivot in technology delivery towards agile. And more recently, a, a deeper pivot towards DevOps or DevSecOps is a term that many have, may have heard. Um, and this all highlights the need for earlier automation. 
And so from a QA perspective, that means that there's a deeper focus on in-sprint automation. And that just means that testers need to automate user story uh, testing and execution alongside development within a given sprint. Uh, in most organizations, a sprint is typically two weeks. Uh, some organizations may have a sprint as three weeks. Um, but, you know, doing automation within that two-week window while you're sitting next to a, develop, a developer is effectively the requirement. Uh, it can include automation of a unit test level item, an API test, or part of a UI test. You'll see, you'll see a representation of that in a testing pyramid that's later in the deck. That, um, that, that another person will speak to. Um, and in this model, um, with DevOps or DevSecOps, uh, having in-sprint automation effectively requires testers to become automation engineers sitting in scrum teams. Um, you need to have an engineering mindset, uh, an automation mindset around conducting that, that type of work. Um, and it's still very people dependent. You need a person to go in and execute that automation work, um, if that makes sense. So, Aprajita, are, are you back or not? Okay. Um, then if we continue forward to the next slide, you would see a listing of some marketplace tools that, show, that, that claim to have AI in them. So these, are, these tools are GUI-based automation AI tools. Um, many of them do scriptless automation, like use of keywords. Um, which is an effective uh, mechanism for doing automation. Um, some tools can also bridge uh, like this technical engineering gap that we, we find often in the QA community. A technical engineering gap um, is, you know, our, our field is really headed towards using SDETs, a software development engineer and test. And that means that um, you have an individual who has a QA DNA about them but they also have the ability to do engineering around automation um, in, sitting in one person, um, you know, where you may not have that capability or skill in an individual sitting in a scrum team or sitting in a DevOps delivery cycle. These marketplace tools uh, can help bridge the gap um, if they allow self-service automation. So tools like Functionize, um, will be listed in the slide. Mabel, Mabel's a really good tool at doing web-based AI tests, it, it does auto healing, visual testing, and things like that. Advance AI, Qualitia, or Testcraft, all claim to provide automation through AI, um, as I've described previously, and without needing armies of people to do uh, that work for you. Jason, so can sort you of see a, the screen now? Uh, let me look. Okay. We can see it, Dabar. I'm, a, I'm sorry, I don't know why my call got dropped. Okay, can you? Okay. Yes, okay, we cool. can, yes. Great. Yeah, that's where I'm at, perfect. So here's a listing of several tools in the marketplace. There are more coming. I'm sure if you were to do a, a Gartner search, you may find more um, brought, brought forward into the Gartner Magic Quadrants, um, or if you do a Google search, you'll likely find more, but these are some of them. The one we've attempted to use and, and are continuing doing, to do a proof of concept with our, is Mabel. That's a fairly effective tool. So that means that you could take a, a, um, a manual tester, use a tool like Mabel that can go identify objects on a page, have it identify the AI components needed for future-based tests, and effectively you can have a, an AI-based automation tool for GUI testing, and you may not need um, deep engineering skill and a person using the tool set. So th that's effectively it for this slide. Uh, next slide. And then topic two. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, yeah, so no problem. Next, next, we would be talking about uh, the next generation of testing needs, and I'll let Andrew and Jason do the talking. Yeah, so the reason why um, we're pursuant of automation, and you'll, you'll see later in the slide my recommendation, is that QA is often seen as expensive. So in, in the QA world, you typically talk about a few things. You talk about dev to QA ratios. So that's a ratio of developers to numbers of QA folks in a given scrum, a given project, a given initiative, or a given team size, whatever the, the metric or the unit is that you're looking at. So if, if you're an organization that, that invests in technology, you typically want new things developed. You don't want to spend a ton on quality. And that's a 
this isn't a new insight. This is something I've been dealing with, you know, over 20 years in my career. And QA often is seen as over testing. And I firmly believe that there's a lot of that too. So a test effectiveness is a metric that's, that we typically look at that shows lots of testing. So test execution, but without finding defects. And so the ratio for me um, is test effectiveness is represented as the number of tests I execute divided by the number of defects that I define or detect, right? So the, the most effective testing group would be um, where you have a ratio of one. So every test I execute finds a defect. Or you could even loosen that up a little bit to say every test I execute proves acceptance criteria for a given user story or for um, user acceptance and sign off if you're in a waterfall delivery model. So that's something to keep in mind too. We want an effectiveness ratio close to one where every test I execute has meaning and value either in defect detecting a defect or proving acceptance criteria for a project. Uh, next slide. So automation came about along with DevOps to change the game, right? So I talked uh, previously about SDETs. Um, they are engineers. Um, they brought forward in-sprint automation um, while maintaining QA DNA about them. So that's an important distinction for people to understand is that how our field is rapidly evolving. Um, and so state of maturities may show SDETs eventually fixing code defects, um, which I'm, I'm very proud of is where I feel we're headed as a QA discipline. And so now that people dependence is a little more rationalized, right? In, 20, in automation worlds of 20 years ago, you would have a separate team dedicated to doing automation, and you would have a team dedicated to doing manual hands-on functional testing, right? So in a given sprint, you may have one manual tester and one automation tester. Those roles are now blended with the advent of an SDET. Um, so you have that person who has QA DNA, understands how to functionally test, but also drive and script automation at the point of development. So that's where we're headed as a QA group. And that's it for that slide. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Um, so yeah, sure. that's, you took uh, some points that I'll probably kind of overlap you on, but I think, um, you know, this, this is a, a page from the World Quality Report, obviously, and it talks about how important end user satisfaction is, and it's going to be. Um, and I think when I think about this and I look at this slide, you know, you, you see more and more companies are relying on apps and software to make money and, um, you know, make a positive brand. And when things fail um, or don't work as expected, it's a bad experience and you can ultimately lose money, right? So the end user satisfaction is more important than it's ever been and it's going to be um, um, sorry it's going to be more important as time goes on right and I think as testers um, it's easy to get caught in just testing requirements and checking off the boxes and um, you know that's important right but I think at the end of the day it's important to make sure we have a holistic view of quality and why are we doing what we're doing not how and the what as much but like at the end of the day, we want to make sure our users are satisfied. And that can even be like making sure we're reading reviews from app stores and um, getting actual feedback from users touching your software. Um, <clears throat> you know, stuff like that where maybe it's hard for a user to find a piece of functionality that we thought was easy when we were building the product, right? Um, so next slide. Um, and then now we have like a new problem with testing or an increasing problem with testing, right? This coverage gap. We have more and more platforms. We're testing on wearables. We're testing on cars now. And um, this, this, this complexity is growing exponentially and the tests and the way we do testing today um, <clears throat> is not going to be able to probably cover that gap. So I think ultimately AI is going to be what helps us close this gap. And how do you test, um, a product that's on a, a smartwatch, um, multiple Android devices, multiple iOS devices, and so on and so forth. I'm sure most people in this um, webinar have experienced some of this pain. Um, but so if you go to the next slide, we'll I can talk to you about more like what we're seeing at Pink Lion. Um, we're seeing a shift in just the overall mentality on testing and QA. 
Um, right on the left here, you see the um, test pyramid, which I'm sure most people are familiar with, right? It's unit test, integration test, UI tests, where you test, tests, you have more of them. They're a little cheaper, faster, um, but smaller um, tests. And then you have less UI tests because they're a little more brittle. They're time intensive. You have, it's almost like maintaining a separate product when you have, you know, an Appium or a Selenium um, test suite to maintain. Um, so, you know, we're thinking, hey, maybe this is going to change into a test cake. You know, we're converting the pyramid to a cake because AI, um, you know, with these UI tools that Jason was just showing you, um, <clears throat> makes UI testing a lot cheaper. We can do, I mean, even with us, we're using test AI and, um, you know, we can write a login test in uh, minutes instead of hours or days. So what does that do, right? And so we're at, if we look at the UI layer here on the cake, we, we're at the point of BBTs, we call them, business verification tests. And basically that's where the bot will randomly explore your app and click around and kind of just get a sense of the really basic core tests. Um, but then we're also able to take these deep learning models and create custom tests. So, you know, you want to tell the AI agent, hey, I want you to log in and then enter a password and, you know, check this and go here and verify that. Um, so we're there today um, and it's going to get improved and it's definitely changing the way we test. I don't think it's going to kill test jobs. It's just going to um, change the way testers do their do their job, right? It will free up some of the redundant tasks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you ultimately get to qualitative, like the movie AI kind of thing where AI generates tests and it recommends points of failure and um, kind of starts to have a mind of its own. Um, but that's the general AI and hey, we're not quite there yet. Yep. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so this is what I also shared at a recent presentation that Devar and I were at in Ireland around how AI should work for QA tools. So um, it's really about the separation between human intelligence and machine intelligence. So it's identifying what people do best and then what machines could do best in, if given uh, testing as, as their responsibility, right? So effectively, I believe that humans can best drive strategy, or in, strategy ensuring breadth and depth in our testing. Um, the thinking that, that's required to to driving an effective test approach and strategy versus letting machines doing learning and executing execution of those tests um, would be their best uh, responsibility. That's where machines should be focusing. And I, I feel effectively that's where we're headed to. Uh, next slide. So the question is, can AI be predictive? Um, and I believe the answer is yes. So. You know, we can we can do predictive machine learning, um, although the tools in the marketplace don't do that today. Uh, so they, I feel we could build neural networks and scan code repository tools like Synopsys, Veracode, SonarCube, and others to drive deep understanding of code that's changing through that code analysis, maybe assessing the spider web effect of a change, cyclomatic complexity of code, or other risk areas to drive the t where testing should focus. And use that identification and learning to build intelligence in making recommendations on a given change, helping to right-size testing. Yeah. Next slide. That I've just described and saying before a change is made, where, where, where are the hotspot areas that I need to focus my testing based upon dev code um, and assessments that they're in? In addition to everything I've learned from past execution cycles, like I talked about previously, you know, those ex post facto models, you could use both to have your skilled SDETs build breadth and depth in testing and let the, the tools uh, that are laden with AI really do the, hand, really do the execution um, and the, you know, the, the test execution work. Um, effectively, you no longer could, should need those armies of people that many of our organizations may have offshore that are merely just doing low-skilled test execution, right? Let's let the machines do that work. Next slide. And that, I think, is our end state. I think that's where we're headed. Um, 
you know, using predictive AI and ML automation along with the self-service tools that we talked about previously would effectively reduce that need for excess staff. You can effectively get to that effectiveness ratio of one um, if you're more surgically precise. You ensure that you're not over-testing, you ensure that you're not under-testing if you know what code areas are changing and focus there. And if you know what, um, what you've learned from prior execution cycles and can refine your approach, uh, you can be more accurate in what you test. Um, and that effectively would lead to long-term cost reductions in our discipline. Um, and employees can focus on the breadth and depth in testing and not have to worry so much about how much time do I have available to execute my test cycles with my cost and those sorts of things. Next slide. Yeah, and um, I wanted to say that Jennifer is actually on now. So Andrew, why don't Great. we see if she can join? Maybe the two of you could talk to us, talk through this. And welcome, Jennifer. Hey. <laughs> Go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> um, so yeah, okay. So yeah, just the skill set changes, and I, I think I touched on that. It's, for a second there before, but um, you start to think about how is AI going to affect the way we do our jobs and um, how is all this data going to affect the way we do this job of QA. And I actually think that uh, machine learning really lends itself well to a testing mindset because a lot of it is um, getting data sets. And even over here, we spend a lot of time writing scripts to just crawl websites or call APIs to collect data and store it in a database, which is very similar to, you know, an automation engineer's job. Um, but even after you get that and you feed the data into a machine learning model, um, you're, <clears throat> you gotta, you gotta test the outputs just like a tester. So, you know, if I feed data in, does it, the model produce the right prediction or whatever output we're expecting. Okay. Right. <clears throat> so I think we'll see more and more of that going forward um, <clears throat> and so and using these AI bots to be your virtual assistant right like taking some of the uh, low-hanging fruit off your plate and allowing the human mind to do what it does best right we're creative and we think outside of the box and um, let's let the bots take care of some of the things that end up being redundant and sucking time out of your day um, and focus on that quality picture I don't know if Jennifer, you have anything to say. <laughs> uh, okay. Airport, oh, she's mute, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here's Jennifer. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I would just reiterate what I heard everyone saying around, you know, this is such a great opportunity for folks in the testing space to really focus their skills on those higher level thinking and critical thinking skills and problem solving, as well as really getting to utilize data sets to drive decisions that impact companies and organizations. Because what we're also seeing is with all this AI, there's tons of new data that we frankly just didn't have time to gather before that we now have to use to make more informed decisions in our companies and in our products. Awesome. Um, Aprajita, would you like me to go to topic three? Yes, Damar, please go ahead. Okay, so it's really great to just keep on this screen for a moment. It says understanding of business processes and voice of the consumer. Earlier, Andrew talked about reading reviews, understanding user satisfaction, you know, are they satisfied with the product, L looking at feedback from users, and that's where I come in. So I'm a content producer. Uh, my background, as I mentioned, was I was at NPR for over two decades, but now I'm creating a cultural content for AI. Um, so last night at an event called AI Girls, which is a networking event, we demoed our uh, conversational AI named Sina. Jennifer was there and um, others. And it was really uh, 
amazing to hear a conversational AI, you know, tell stories. But then the question is like, how do we test my product, which by the way, will be on Google Assistant in the form of text on my website and on uh, Facebook Messenger where the characters have to be less than what Google allows, right? So we have to think of the business process and how are we going to make sure that the end product is relevant, that consumers felt that they've been uh, reached or you know, connected to effectively, and the business feels like as testers, you are also you know, giving feedback on many different platforms. So uh, that was, this is a really great slide in terms of the third topic. So Aprajita, I'd love you to join me on this. Uh, we have started um, a global data set challenge. And um, this is because, as you all know, many of the AI models that currently exist are not inclusive. Uh, and um, the goal is to really, in the next 10 years, do data set challenges that allow us to bring data sets around women, data sets around um, heritage and healthcare, data sets around indigenous knowledge, um, many of the things that are going to probably be important as we build smart cities like disability, autism, right? These are all gonna have to come into play for smart cities. Aprajita, would you like to uh, talk a little bit more about the algorithm challenge itself? Yes, um, so I'm, I'm so happy to be talking about this. Davar and I connected last year uh, at Test Masters Academy's uh, conference in June uh, in New York. Actually, that was this year, not last year. <laughs> yeah, in June. Uh, and she was talking about uh, a data set challenge, which was around stories of women. And it really struck me. I was like, this is so important. It is so important for us to be inclusive about the data that is used in building AI models. Um, and even in the future, because that is that is what it's going to be like. My son right now, for example, uses Google and Siri every single day. And so I don't see a future where these uh, algorithms are not going to be in place. And it's very important for us to start building these uh, with data sets that are inclusive and not biased. Um, and I'll let Davar continue on uh, the exact uh, challenge that she, uh, her team is launching. Yes. So. Um... We are currently in crowdfunding mode, uh, and we hope to actually launch the crowdsourcing part of this challenge in May. But this, as I mentioned, is the first of 10 global AI uh, storytelling challenges that will introduce uh, and hopefully advance cultural IQ in AI systems. Um, the Women's Dataset Challenge uh, will also appear on AI Commons, and what this means, it already is on AI Commons. Uh, AI Commons is a nonprofit organization that has brought together uh, people from many different backgrounds and disciplines from Stanford to Uber to Facebook, uh, all over the world. And the goal is to put methodologies and data sets on AI Commons, sort of like the- so are, are you there? Yeah. Can you not hear me? I, I can hear you, Devar. This oh, is Jason. Okay, okay great. Yes, so yes, the goal is to put all of the methodology and uh, final data sets on AI Commons, uh, sort of like the Wikipedia of the future, so others can get, have access and be able to build, uh, you know, products and solutions with new data sets. And um, as I mentioned maybe earlier, we're partnering with Anna Roisman of Testmaster Academy, who is holding this uh, webinar. Um, and also five, uh, four others between now and April 2020. So we are very excited to be working with you. Uh, I wanted to just give two anecdotes or stories before we go to questions. Uh, the first one is that the reason Aprajita and I connected so deeply um, is because she's in the healthcare industry and she understands that when it comes to precision medicine and building clinical trials for people from all different backgrounds, there's major challenges because the data is not relevant to certain populations. As you might know, the Natural, National Institutes of Health has 
uh, called for one million new data around people from African American, Hispanic, Asian backgrounds because the data that exists again for clinical trials is not sufficient. And so somebody like Aprajita looks like looks at what I'm trying to do, and she's like, you know what? In my industry, in healthcare and precision medicine, this is a huge problem. So just imagine what other industries are going to face as they try to build. Uh, you know, use more AI products and solutions for other purposes. So um, yeah, let's now go to questions and answers. Um, hopefully we'll have answers. <laughs> so um, Anna, are you, um, I know you're monitoring the uh, questions. Does, has anyone shared a question yet? Or maybe can one of you look, um, Jason, can you look at the uh, chat to see if anyone has put in any questions yet? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, it looks like there. It looks like there are no questions yet. Okay. No problem. So maybe um, an Aprajita just got kicked off. Uh, oh, there is a question now. It looks like. How to deal with resistance in teams due to jobs that may reduce. Who wants um, to take that? <laughs> I, I can start, and if anyone wants to chime in, that'd be great. Uh, or it looks like Anna wants to answer that. So, Anna, did you want to answer? She doesn't oh, okay. have audio, so you should go. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so I think it's, it's a natural pivot. Um, in our field to understand that that human beings should be driving strategy, um, ensuring breadth and depth, and, and um, the moving away from really execution. I mean, if you think about it, that's sort of the evolution of automation to begin with. When we had tools like Windrunner and QTP and those old tools of 20, 10, 20 years ago, executing tests, that's, that was fact, effectively that first step in that direction, right? And I believe that many of the offshore outsource partners are pivoting in that direction too. They understand that their business has to change and pivot to a model of, you know, supreme and robust sort of automation executing work and not doing the heavy thinking around strategy and approach, right? So I, I think us as QA leaders should effectively condition our staff for this pivot and change. Um, yeah, and if people can drive strategy and understand their business areas, uh, I think that makes them more effective ultimately, would be a selling point to any individual that's concerned about that. So hopefully that answers the question, Kieran. Yeah. Yeah, and Jason, you and I talked about this in Ireland, um, the idea that they're, the testing and QA community need to step up to the plate and go to their leaders and want to be part of conversations on AI frameworks. They should be in the room. You know, there's yeah, no reason absolutely. why you can't study and learn about, be part of a conversation on ethics, be part of the conversation on, you know, uh, the, the new jobs that are going to be coming up. Maybe you could right. talk a little bit about that. You talked about potentially like an editorial board, you know, for testers to be able to look at all of these other dimensions. Yeah, I think it's, you know, typically we've been pigeonholed, I would say, as a field in doing one thing and not many others, right? And so the way, the way I see it is if the constraints of project execution are alleviated, and those are alleviated because it's now machines with some modicum of intelligence and insight making decisions and, dry, and executing work, that just opens up an entire gambit of things that our, our full-time staff, employees, uh, consultant staff, people can do around thinking. I mean, think about, you know, maybe we don't need to test the entire universe. Maybe we need to test the moon and the sun to be effective and deep in our approach. I think that's more of a value add proposition to any organization than perhaps, you know, what we may be doing today. Can I add to that, Jason? I also feel sure, like absolutely. it's a similar conversation. I remember just a decade back when everybody was so scared about automation, right? right? That's and right. we were like, oh, you know, we're going to lose our, all our jobs because we're going to start automating. 
But has that really happened? No. I think automation wow. has provided us a good uh, set of tools so that we can spend our time doing other things, right? And improvising a uh, test strategy and then really testing, like you said, <laughs> things that are crucial and important uh, and spend our time uh, thinking about our products and our users. And I think AI is going to take us in the same land. It's only uh, another another style of automation uh, in my mind. And uh, it's only going to get better. I do not see this as a competitor to, uh, you know, the jobs that we have right now, right? It should be right. a skill set that we learn and we develop um, and hone, really. That's right. It looks like there was a question over chat. Are there yeah. any AI ML APIs already in the marketplace for QA and testing? So if you're talking strictly about an API, that I'm not aware of. Maybe the other panelists are. Andrew or Jenny? No, I, I, uh, I don't know of an API specifically, right. but I know um, if you check out Appium Classifier plugin on GitHub, um, actually Jonathan Lips, the uh, creator, he's not the creator, maybe he is. He's a maintainer of Appium, and they call him, why do they call him the Appium King or something like that? And he created this Appium Classifier plugin that taps into some machine learning where, you know, when you are trying to automate something and you do find by ID, um, you can do find by, um, you know, UI label or machine learning label. So there, and it's in the very infant stages. Um, it's worth checking out. I think it's a good way to start to play around with ML and see how it is going to affect automation and realize that it's, it's actually going to be really awesome once you get to use these tools. Um, you don't have to worry about, uh, flaky tests as much and oh there's no ID on this object in the DOM or and stuff like that so um, yeah take a look at that that's the first one I comes to my head I'm sure there will be more and more stuff coming out on the open source um, platforms but we also have Travis who's asking are any of the AI tools mentioned available to tinker around with yeah, absolutely. Mabel, you could download a trial version. Um, if you have a website that you're wanting to test with, I encourage you to download it and give it a shot. Um, we did that with one of our uh, web properties, and it worked quite, quite well. So I would imagine any of those tools have freeware that you can give it a shot with or try. Um, another question is, with the comment, of, I think this is for Jason, with the comment for one-to-one -one test to defect ratio, how would AI drive to this ratio? So it's it's the the notion that using tooling that's after the fact, saying you know let's be more precise in the regression testing that maybe we do, based upon what defects I've detected with my ten prior execution cycles, that's one. So they make recommendations on, you know maybe I don't need to execute a thousand tests, I only need to execute eighty. So that's learning that makes that brings that ratio closer to one but not completely to one because I don't have, I'm not very predictive, right? And that, that's my recommendation in the marketplace that we have more predictive tooling in nature. So if you're predictive and you understand and learn from your past execution cycles, you should be fairly, cl fairly close to a ratio of one in execution. Uh, we're still open to questions if anybody had any. Um, I had a question for Andrew. Could you give us an example of, um, you know, a use case for Pink uh, Lion AI or um, Test AI that you're seeing, you know, either in the gaming industry or sporting industry? Sure, sure. Yeah. So I guess we've been, so what's been interesting in this journey, I mean, we started a company about six months ago. So we've been seeing a lot of really interesting testing challenges, one of which is gaming. Um, traditionally, like big game companies and even um, companies that make game apps like Candy Crush and stuff like that, their UI automation for that kind of thing has typically been that nah, we can't do it uh, because there's so much, uh, so many graphics, so much motion. You talk about DOM, there really isn't a DOM. So a lot of that testing has been done manually. Um, but now that we're using the Pink Lion and we're building on top of the Test AI platform, which uses, you know, deep learning and computer vision and it doesn't care about the DOM, we can actually start to um, automate some things that weren't automatable before, like um, gameplay. But also, 
um, <clears throat> it's good for testing at scale. So uh, say you come uh, a credit card processor and, you know, you see like embedded links on retail websites where it's like Visa Express Checkout or, um, you know, PayPal. And so when you're buying something, it's just like click this link and it will go to your PayPal account and pay for it that way. Um, for companies like that, they have issues like how do we test a uh, hundred thousand sites with this thing embedded in it, right? And AI is a great use case for that, where it can it can do like five tests on each one of those websites, and um, and actually can it, once it's seen so many. I think our model's seen seventy thousand mobile apps by now, so it's getting an understanding of how mobile apps are structured, and actually can do some really primitive tests, like add something to a cart and then verify the PayPal link is working, right? So we're trying to go after some of these things that weren't automatable before. Um, in terms of like your traditional testing is actually still pretty relevant and AI is not necessarily the best candidate for it. Um, you know, API testing is very good candidate for traditional scripting and stuff like that because the APIs are very predictable. And if you have to change these framework, it's pretty minimal, right? Um, but so we're trying to find that layer. Can I ask a follow-up question? Like uh, the example that you gave where you can add things to the cart. So is this something where, like, I, I, I think it's interesting to know where the users can actually go and tell, you know, that, okay, can you run this use case or that use case, you know, uh, on adding to cart the type of items? Or is it just that um, the model will do whatever is you know on its own this is like yeah, a question that comes up quite often yeah yeah yep. i, I no. spent a lot of time answering this one so <laughs> <laughs> yeah no yeah. what i was gonna say this is jennifer i figured i'd help or weigh in with andrew but um what's what pink lion does and kind of our mission in life is to do exactly what you said is help with the resistance that all of us naturally have to change and change is hard sometimes and you need that advocate sitting next to you helping you through the change and coaching you through it so part of what we do with these models that andrew's mentioning like the credit card example or the gaming example is sit side by side with people in the industry and help them make a transition and teach them how to train their bots so really um like you said, what you can do with the tool we're talking about is you can go in and have it do a crawl where it builds an app graph. So it gives you um, the mapping of your entire website or mobile app. So it works on web and mobile. And then after that, once it's crawled and it's you've labeled all of the elements um, that are there, it auto labels a lot of them. Because as Andrew said, it's seen over 70,000 websites and apps. So it knows what a lot of things are it gives the power into the hands of those testers to write really good strategic scenarios. So instead of having to give it 12 steps to get to its goal, you can say start here and here if you want and just say start at home screen and get to shopping cart. You can say start here and here with a verification where I want to make sure I can add an item over $10 and an item under $10 to cart or add a sale item or any of those things. So it now has the capability besides just doing the crawl where it does its own work and thinking and giving you back information and patterns. You can teach it where you want it to go and the types of scenarios you want it um, to also do. And you can set those up just like you would your traditional automation as a suite of say smoke tests or regression tests that run either ad hoc when you want them to or on a scheduled basis, plugged into your pipeline for DevOps. So it's really pretty robust now what's coming out and people have access to and, and that capability to learn how this works um, and how to leverage these new tools, as you mentioned, it's just another you know smarter layer um, or intelligent layer of automation on top of traditional, how to start using that for folks um, that haven't seen it before. Um, and looks like Kiran asked, will AI, AI can help create scenarios on business acceptance criteria? Can you share a few examples? And I think we just answered that. Um, to create tests based on, okay. Yeah, I mean, well, that's something we're thinking a lot about. So, you know, one of the things the we can do kind of when we mentioned that with the checkout process is, 
uh, you group apps into categories. And once you start to look at enough of these apps, you realize there's a lot of commonalities like retail apps all have shopping carts and typically don't have a login in the beginning and stuff like that. So um, we're trying to kind of boiler boil down the essentials in certain categories of applications and then have like some generic tests that can be run. Um, you know, and, and theoretically you could also do things like um, track how a user use your application with like Google analytics and some of the marketing analytics tools, and then use that information to actually generate tests. So you're more, your testing can mimic what users actually use your applications for. So there's some really interesting possibilities with that kind of idea. Yeah, I, I wanted to share that uh, this is exactly the kind of conversation we wanted to have so that as we build the next four webinars, we can, you know, focus them on uh, ex real life examples. Uh, so some of what the, has been, uh, you know, asked in questions or what you all have just brought up is perfect. And we can sort of divide these up and uh, right, Aprajita and Jennifer and Jason, have them be part of future webinars where we actually dissect them more. Um, and also the yeah. real life uh, example of, you know, how do you test an algorithm or how do you test a data set? These are all the kinds of things that we hope to be able to do together um, in the next few months. Did anyone want to talk about that? Like where, where do you think we should go next? I know Aprajita, you and I and Anna have talked about some ideas. Yeah. So, um, the la next couple of months when um, Anna and Devar were talking about this, we really, really wanted the QA community to come together and really understand uh, what AI is, not just from testing perspective, but what does it really mean when you say an AI system? Um, and so we're hoping to build these webinars, which um, Anna will launch and you'll get information on them. Uh, some of, uh, a few of them would be a deep dive uh, and a literal uh, dive you know, dissection like um, uh, the VAR said into how, what and like neural network looks like, how do you build it, you know, um, and understand uh, the basics of it. And then even getting into how do you test something like this, whether you have AI tools or not, um, so on and so forth. We'll also touch base upon um, the data set challenge that um, the VAR has in how uh, we as a uh, QA community can come together and leverage that to learn more about um, machine learning and AI. Um, we have Travis. Uh, he says, thank you all for this webinar. Uh, is there a set schedule for the upcoming webinars? Uh, thank you, Travis, for the question. Uh, I think Anna is going to announce them um, as we go. Um, and uh, keep a watch on uh, Test Masters Academy um, uh, notifications and announcements. Uh, I'm, we are hoping to have one in January. That's right, Dava, right? Yeah, it's end of January, that one. We have a date, but as Aprajita said, uh, Anna will be announcing January, February, March. And if you're interested in joining us as a panelist or expert, and I know Jennifer, you are interested in doing a deep dive, uh, please connect with us, connect with Anna and uh, help us build I wanted to give a major shout out to Jason, who we met in Ireland. And I really, his, his presentation in Ireland was one of the best ones. And he was gracious enough to share it as the basis for, you know, the conversation that we have today, in addition to uh, Jennifer, Andrew, and Aprajita adding slides. Well, thank you for setting this up. I no accolades needed. I'm I'm happy to participate and and very happy to be part of the community. So thank you for the opportunity, Devar and team. It was great paneling with everybody today. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful, wonderful Wednesday. Uh, we hope to see you in January. And thank you for the amazing panelists. I uh, hope to talk to you guys soon. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you.